Marito, Marito. He he did a good job, Robert Pattinson. You know. All right, guys, welcome back in. Uh, today, I'm gonna be giving you a review of Hayao Miyazaki's latest and last, not really his last, uh, film, The Boy and the Heron. And I only air quoted that because originally this was supposed to be Hayao Miyazaki's last film, but he recently came out afterwards and said, hey, you know what? I'm not fucking leaving! <laughs> All right, guys, and before I get any further, I'm gonna let you know now there will be spoilers in this video. So if you have not seen the movie and you intend to, don't watch this unless you don't care then go ahead keep watching i don't care see if i care see, really see if i care the story itself follows mahito a 12 year old boy who is struggling to deal with the death of his mother and also on top of that moving to a new town he is struggling and he's trying his best to adjust as with most miyazaki films there is a magical element to this and in this story comes the heron what makes this heron special is that he can talk and he also can shapeshift in some ways to become a more human-like figure as soon as mahito moves into his new home he spots the heron and the heron spots him and they have eye contact and this heron will not leave him alone until finally he gets him alone after struggling for days and tells mahito so, hey, follow me because your mom, she's actually still alive. And Mahito, being a young boy who is curious, is like, you know what? Maybe you're right. And in Mahito's new home is a whole gaggle of grandmas. That's right. There are several grandmas in the story. Great ones, young ones, old ones, all alike. But also there is his aunt who is the main mother of the home. And the interesting thing about his aunt is that that is now his new stepmom. So he has to deal with that. That's right. His dad left his mother and started dating the younger sister. Although he didn't leave the mother. The mother passed away, like I mentioned earlier. And he was like, you know what? The next best thing would be to date you, your, her sister, you're everything like her. So Maito has to also struggle with the fact that, hey, my dad's moving on, but it's not just to a regular person, it's to my aunt. And these gaggle of grandmas and the aunt as well have been trying their best to stop Mahito from exploring the grounds and also interacting with this heron because they do have a sense of magical elements that are in the land. Also, there is a big tower in the middle of a lake and this tower has a bunch of magical elements to it and they kind of don't know really what the whole story is behind it. They just know, hey, don't go over there, Mahito, because it, it's some crazy stuff going on over there. You don't want none of this, do we? And you don't want no part of this shit. And Mahito's like, you know what? I think I do. I think I do want some of that because my mom might be alive and she's in there and I'm gonna follow you, a talking bird. Yeah, let, let's do it. Once Mahito passes through this world, he finds out that it's not everything that it seems. It seems to be some sort of, uh, I guess, beginning and also ending of life realm where everything comes up and goes down. It's like beneath our world, I guess. And it's, it's kind of like, I guess, purgatory, but a little bit more fleshed out. And that's where most of the story takes place is in this world and it does have the Miyazaki magical elements to it and, and mystical creatures and, and fun times and also food. There is food in this movie. And yeah, I don't want to give a full, you know, plot review of it, but that's where the main story is going to take place. So as far as the film itself and the way I feel about it, I'm still not completely sure. I did watch it yesterday, so I'm still processing what I have seen. But when I walked out of the theater, I was like, hey, you know what? That was definitely a movie and definitely Miyazaki was trying something there. For me, the most interesting thing is seeing him go back into the world of magic and, and, and fairy tales, I guess. Because before this, we got The Wind Rises, which was a uh, story that was mostly set ground level. It wasn't too crazy. There was like the visions and dreams that the main character was having, but it wasn't super out there like, you know, Spirited Away or Howl's Moving Castle. And even compared to those, I feel like this movie does take bigger risks and it does do uh, the magic realm of everything a little bit to the next level. And it's good not to get like the same beat for beat thing every time whenever Miyazaki does stuff. I do appreciate the fact that he does try, try to uh, tell his stories with a, a different twist on them every time. And the messages that he has, like underlying themes, do get hidden pretty well. But for me, this one, I didn't really understand the, the I guess, the entire meaning of it. I feel like I wasn't smart enough coming out of this movie. Like, was I supposed to get this? Did I, did I miss something? I guess the biggest thing that I could say, because I went to go see it with Chris, shout out to Chris, he thinks that it mainly is just like a, a existential crisis type of story, which I guess I do see in some way because um, the main, the, the gruncle, the great uncle of these children is trying to find a successor for someone who could build a new world. Basically, he's like the, the, the creator, the god of this world, this little pocket dimension that we're in. And he's struggling like, hey, who's going to take over for me? I got to find the right person that can keep doing my job and do it better than me and take it further than what I've already taken and who can build something new and innocent and not full of malice. And with that, maybe he's saying, you know, how I mentioned earlier, how this was supposed to be Miyazaki's last film. Is he trying to pass on the torch of being this big time uh, director and filmmaker in Japan in the category of 
animation? Am I passing it to somebody new who's gonna be the one to take up the mantle? Or is there nobody around that can really take it from me? So let me just continue to make this. And maybe that's what he felt towards the end of making it. Maybe he was like, you know what? Maybe there is no one out there currently that I could see myself passing this torch to that I feel like can do a better job than me. Like I can do what you can do, but you just, you're not gonna take it any further. You're just gonna take it and just kind of keep it stagnant of where, you know, all this progress that I've made in this, the world of filmmaking, it's gonna be the same because, you know, you're not improving upon what I've already created, these, these, these bricks that I've laid, this foundation. There's no one that can do it like me. Or is it the other way? Is Mahito a version of Miyazaki? Did somebody pass him the torch of animation and directing? Did someone say, hey, you are the one who can take this further than what I needed to be? And this is him telling us how like he saw that whole thing happening. Maybe he was going through a rough time. Maybe somebody in his life passed away and he just always kept his, kept to himself and he kept his like, I guess his talents because throughout the story we see Mahito have some sort of talents within like building and crafting and he didn't really like share that with anybody because he is a pretty reserved character throughout the entire story. And I've seen that complaint online that Mahito's not, you know, super fleshed out. He's pretty close to the chest, all his feelings, everything that he's going through, he doesn't really express them. And I can see that he doesn't really do anything that's like, hey, I know him now. Like, I, I feel for this guy. It's kind of just like, hey, this is the main character. This is the the eyes of the story that we're getting through. We're looking through his eyes. Like, it's, it's whatever. He's not like super important because I didn't feel any sort of way in the story for Mahito. I didn't feel like sad for him. I didn't feel happy for him. I was just like, you know what? He's, he's there as a storyteller. And maybe this wasn't the message that Miyazaki was trying to send, uh, you know, a story about grief because I feel like they didn't touch upon it enough for me to really care. Mahito goes through this traumatic experience as a child where his mom dies in a fire and he doesn't get to see her. He just sees the flames and through the story we see him just be quiet and reserved and that's how some people deal with it. They are quiet and reserved and they don't really want to express all the time that they are grieving, but we didn't see anything to make us feel like I, he, you know, really misses his mom. It was just kind of like, my mom is dead and this heron's like, hey, your mom's alive. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, I do want to see her again. But it wasn't, I didn't feel that it was earned. I didn't feel like he was like, oh, I need to see her. He was just kind of like, oh yeah, well, yeah, I'll go see her. Why not? I mean, she's, she's there, right? Let me go find her, I guess. And I just feel like that was a missed opportunity because in the story we see him meet Hime, who was supposed to be his mother, but younger. And for some reason, it feels like it didn't click in his head who she was. Cause she even says, oh, you're looking for my sister, which is his aunt. And he's like, oh yeah, I am. He didn't say like, oh wait, your sister, you're my mom. It just, it seemed weird. Like they formed a quick bond together when they were trying to like, you know, search through the castle or whatever, but they didn't really like seem to have a mother and son relationship. Like if I had met my mom when she was younger, I probably would have been like reacting way different than he is. I would have been like, oh, you're my mom. That's crazy. Let me ask you some questions. Let me see how you are as a person at this age. How adventurous are you? How scared are you? What do you like to do? He was just kind of like, oh, cool. You're... I guess the sister of this person I'm looking for, can you help me find this other person? I don't really care really who you are. Until the end when he's like, oh, or she's, they're splitting up, I guess. And she's like, hey, I have to go through my door. I'm gonna be your mom. And he's like, okay, well, I'm glad to meet you. And then that was kind of it. And I was like, that's a little whack that he didn't really explore that more, I guess. But like I mentioned, maybe it wasn't the meaning or the theme of his story in this story. He wanted something completely different. He didn't care. That was kind of like on the back burner for him. And then even towards the end, I feel like the ending was so abrupt and like out of nowhere. He was the whole time, the Grunkle was trying to find the successor and he finds it in Mahito and he's like, okay, I want you to make a decision. I need you to become my successor and, and build this new world. And Mahito's like, well, maybe I should. I can't go visit my world. If I do this though, there are some consequences. And then out of nowhere, here comes Dave Batista being Dave Batista. And he's like, you know what, fuck it. I'll do it live. And he, he, he messes up the entire timeline and everybody's like, okay, let's just go back to our world. And then that was kind of it. They didn't really, I feel like, explore that long enough, which is weird because it was a two hour movie. You feel like they could have at least fleshed the ending out a little bit more. And that's like another complaint of mine is the pace of this. It is so slow in the beginning. I even was kind of falling asleep a little bit. That's how slow it was. They were just kind of like exploring the new uh, home that he's in and he's kind of looking around in like the typical Miyazaki fashion, like look at the nature, look at the backgrounds. I'm like, okay, yes, I get it, but let's, get to the, where the story is supposed to be going. And it takes so long for the heron to be like, hey, follow me, let's go. And he's like, oh, okay, yeah, let's follow you, let's go. And it's just like, they could have pushed that pace a little bit 
faster to where we could have gotten a better ending or a more fleshed out ending, I feel. But speaking of Herons, uh, that was the standout for me, Robert Pattinson killed this. I know that was going into it, everyone's big thing. They were like, oh my God, this is his voice. He's, he's voicing his Heron and it doesn't sound anything like him. And I agree, it sounds nothing like him. And I do like the fact that he went through different ranges of his voice when he was like the actual heron when he was the bird he was kind of like ah mahito but then when he became the person he was more like cartoony with it he was like hey mahito come follow me blah, 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 blah. and it's like oh i can see what you're doing here as you're transforming and becoming more you know evil or more like nefarious you have different voices that you go through and i was like you know what robert pattinson he did a good job he he really did kill his performance and i really feel like he's going to be a favorite for people watching this kind of like how calcifer stole the show in hell's moving castle i feel the same way about robert pattinson everyone's going to like this character even though he's not like the super main character they're like hey he's the coolest one he's the most fun i enjoy him a lot and then everybody else was kind of just there uh you know the main guy, Luca Provard, I think his last name is, he did a good job as being just like the main character with what he got to work with. He wasn't, you know, saying a lot of lines, it was just kind of what was written for him. He did fine. Florence Pugh, I enjoyed her performance a lot. She played the character very well, the, the Kiriko, the young Kiriko. She had like the husky, like, I can do it, Look, I got it. Like that, I, I can't do it. But she played that role perfectly, enjoyed her performance. Uh, Hema Chan, Gemma Chan, I think it's Hema, as the ant. She was fine, nothing, nothing too crazy. And Christian Bale, I feel like, man, after going from Hallow's Moving Castle to this, you're, you feel like you just kind of phoned this one in. You were just using your own voice. At least you kept your accent, I guess that's something. So that made it, I guess, cool that he used that, but also that's just his regular speaking voice. So it was just him just saying lines in a booth. I feel like he didn't really like go for it. Willem was in this, Willem Dafoe, shout out to Willem. He played like the, the noble pelican and he did a good job, he typical evil Willem Dafoe fashion. It's funny because I feel like at some points uh, Robert Pattinson's performance sounded like Willem Dafoe at some points, especially when he was doing just like the evil voice. I was like, hey, is that Willem? I'm like, no, 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 it's Robert Pattinson. So I got him a little mixed up there with that, the vocal range there, but he did a good job. And then Dave Bautista, like I mentioned earlier, he was just Dave Bautista, AKA just Drax. That's what it felt like. And I think that's it as far as voices go. Oh, and um, what's your name from the boys, Kimmy, Sorry, Karen Fukuhara, she did the voice of Hime, AKA Mahito's mom, but young. She did a good job. So everybody else did like, they're okay, but I feel like the standout was Robert Pattinson. He was the one really like going forward and he took the role serious, it seems like. Apparently he had a bunch of voice recordings on his iPhone to audition and I guess he just sent it in and they were like, you know what, you did a good job, fuck it, you're, you're the heron. But yeah, definitely Miyazaki, it's a, it's a good, visual fest for you. You're gonna enjoy the animation of it. There are a lot of scenes in here that just, you know, ring true to the Miyazaki style, like I mentioned earlier with like the backgrounds and the food part, but also it does explore his more like gruesome and um, unsettling personality. It comes through in this with like the transformation of the heron and then like the little, um, at the end there's like little things that happen that remind me of it. I don't, you know, I can't like explain it to you right now. They're just like, the way the world transforms and everything and the way some of these creatures look, it does show you that Miyazaki has that side to him. Like if he really wanted to go full unsettling, cause we've gotten it a few times in some films, like, you know, Spirited Away has like the, the spider dude and then uh, no face and all that stuff. He could really make something cool visually if he wanted to like make like a straight up horror thriller type movie, he would, he would kill it, I feel like. So it was cool to see like him let some of those styles come through in this. And the soundtrack, obviously, uh, Miyazaki's known for his soundtracks for his films. Uh, nothing really stuck out, like, you know, it doesn't seem iconic yet. Maybe it will in time, but for me, it just kind of like helped the scene progress and it kind of like blended into the scenes, which is really, I guess, what you want for background music. You don't want it to overpower your scenes. So I feel like a lot of the, the soundtrack did do its job. It was it was there, it was present, but it wasn't overpowering. And yeah, overall, it was it was good. Don't get me wrong, it is still a good film. It's just that me, I feel like walking out of it, I didn't quite get what I was supposed to get out of it. I didn't, I didn't feel like, you know, I understood it. And I don't wanna like shit on it completely if I don't get it, just cause I don't understand it. Doesn't mean that you guys won't understand it. It's just me, it, I, didn't, I didn't quite get it. I'm not smart enough, I guess, to understand what was happening. Or maybe I'm just, overthinking what the story is supposed to be about and his message that he wanted to get through to us is. So with that being said, I feel like for me, as far as like the, the rankings of Miyazaki films, this would be kind of middle of the road towards the bottom for me, just because the way it made me feel, I guess at the end of the day, because I feel like that's the biggest or strongest 
way to review a film. You can give me all the techniques and like uh, voice work and characters and all this stuff that you want to give me. But at the end of the day, if it made you just feel like you enjoyed it or you feel like you had fun or you feel like it was scary, that's the best thing, I think. As long as you felt something, if it made you feel a certain way, then you should just go with that and say, you know what, I felt this way, so this is why I feel this way. So for me, I felt leaving the movie a little confused. So for me, I feel like it's not his best work. But that's just my opinion, and that's my review for The Boy and the Heron. Uh, go see if you have and I'm gonna give it a final review. If I had to, I'm gonna do this on Letterbox out of five. I gave it a three, and I give most films that I'm not sure about a three. I give them that baseline score, like, hey, you made a film, you went out and did something, I understood that it took a lot of effort, so here's a three, because I can't give you a one or a two, because that's disrespectful, but I can't give you a four or five, because in my heart of hearts, I know that's not how I felt about it. I didn't feel like it earned that four or five. So middle little three rating for me out of five stars. But yeah, that's gonna be my review. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. If you didn't, you can let me know down below in the comment section. Hey, your review sucked, or hey, your review was good, or hey, I haven't seen it yet. Whatever you wanna do, comment it down below. I'll reply, and most of the time I do. And if you wanna like it, that's cool. If you wanna subscribe, that's also very cool. And also if you wanna follow us on any platform, we're down there below as well. TikTok, Instagram. That's really it, really. So I guess if you wanna follow us on those two, go do that. And uh, yeah, until next time, go follow that heron. Maybe he'll lead you on a fun adventure.